In this podcast, we're going to talk about the relationship between electrons and light. All right, so when we were working with the flame test in class, um, we saw a color. So if you add just the right amount of energy to an atom, the electron will jump up energy levels. Okay, so down here you see a picture of an electron. Okay, it's orbiting the nucleus. You input light. Light is energy, right? And so the electron absorbs that energy from the light, jumps up to a higher ring or higher energy level. And then when the electron drops back down to the ground state or to its original position, that it, extra energy it had initially absorbed is now emitted in the form of a photon of light, okay? And so however much it absorbs, it also emits the same amount, and then we'll be able to see that light, that visible light, with our eyeball, okay? So we'll be able to see what that transition look like, looks like. All right, so here's another um, closer picture of that. The energy of that electron the electron gets depends on the orbit that it's in and the orbit that it's going to. So when it jumps from one orbital to another, it emits, so that's where you get your emission line, um, or absorbs a photon of a certain energy, okay? The frequency of the emitted or absorbed photon is related to its energy. So when it absorbs this light right here to move up, that is what we would call an absorption spectra, so there'd be certain parts of the visible spectrum missing, and then it emits that same energy of light, and that's where we get our emission spectra, okay? All right, so Bohr's model of the atom described the electrons orbiting the um, nucleus in orbits, and we found that, you know, for hydrogen, when we calculated everything, hydrogen would absorb a certain amount of energy and then release it, and it would emit uh, that photon. So he noticed this, and he described this by saying that electrons can take discrete, can only have specific discrete energy levels, and the energy is related to the radius of the orbit for that electron and the electron can jump between the different orbits um, due to the absorption or emission of the photons or the light energy. Dark lines in the absorption spectra are due to the photons that are absorbed and then the bright lines in the emission spectra are due to the photons being emitted. Okay, now here are some of the colors that we would get for some of the metals of the various different um, cations on the periodic table, so these are some flame test colors. All right, so let's look a little bit more closely at the relationship between the absorption and emission. So when we absorb, we are going to be missing certain parts of the visible spectrum. That's our absorption spectra. And then the same amount of energy is released or emitted, and we'll have a certain wavelength of energy showing up on a black background and that's our emission spectra. Okay, so here's our absorption spectra. These are the energies where we have the black lines. That's the energies for the transitions in hydrogen um, that are absorbed by the atom. And then that dark one is the emission spectra. It shows you what um, what specific wavelengths of light are emitted when the electron moves from the excited state back to the ground state. All right, so again, the color depends on the difference in the energy levels, and Bohr calculated all of these, and he was able to determine for the element hydrogen, this emission spectra, he was able to calculate that the red line represented the um, jump from energy level two to three, the green emission line represented the jump from energy level 2 to 4. The blue line represented the energy level jump from 2 to 5. And the purple line indicated the energy jump from 2 to 6. Now, does that mean that there's not other energy transitions occurring? No, there are other energy transitions occurring, 
It's just that the wavelength of light that is emitted or absorbed does not fall within the visible region, so we don't see it. So we really just want to talk about the ones that we see, but understand that there are other ones that occur outside of our visible spectrum. All right, so now here is a um, close-up of absorption and emission spectrum and you see that they're exact opposite mirrors of each other. So absorption is when you have the black lines, it's what's missing from the visible spectrum. Those are the wavelengths of light that were absorbed by the electrons when they moved up and when they jump back down they let off that same exact energy or wavelength of light and you see it here on the black background. Alright now each element has a unique bright line emission and absorption spectra. However, Bohr's calculations for how he got it based on his circular orbits only worked for hydrogen. The spectra can serve as a sort of atomic fingerprint. So we can use these spectra, look through telescopes into outer space, and we are able to tell what the components of stars are by looking at the line spectra and comparing it with known elements. All right, so this is how we identify things in space um, because every different element has a different emission spectra. Here's hydrogen, sodium, helium, neon, and mercury. So you see they're all very different. Again, understand there are other wavelengths that appear outside of the visible range that are occurring for every element. So every element has a special set of lines, the atom's fingerprint. You can observe these lines and identify the component elements. Make sure you are able to identify absorption and emission spectra and how that can help you learn about the environment of the element. All right, here is our whole entire spectrum. And you see that this little bitty 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 piece right here is the only visible part that we can see. So there are lots of other transitions that can occur that we are not able to see. Again, there's a different depiction, but again, you see the same thing. We are only able to see a very small amount of the light. All right, now here's a different uh, view. It has a bunch of different um, spectra on here, emission spectra for all these different elements. And what do you notice about the number of lines as the elements get bigger? We should notice that as the elements get bigger, there seem to be a lot more lines. The conclusion you can draw from this is that there are a lot more lines because there are a lot more electrons and therefore a lot of more um, transitions that can occur. All right, what about the relationship between the observed flame test color and the emission and absorption spectra lines? Because you saw there were a lot of colors or a lot of lines on those spectra, but on a flame test we only see one thing. Well, this for a couple of reasons. Either all of the spectra is kind of all merged together into one color that predominates that we see um, as the visible light. So this would be something like red plus blue equals purple. So we might have a bunch of red and a bunch of blue uh, transitions and we observe a purple flame. Okay, or there could be a transition that is very, very common in that element. Um, that particular energy is absorbed much more frequently and therefore that may be the spectral line that dominates over the other colors produced during the transitions and therefore that's the one that we see. Okay, so the spectra shows all of the electron transitions and um, the flame test is probably either a merger of all of them or the dominant one. All right, now why can we only see flame test colors for metal? What about the non-metals? Well, quite simply, there's just not enough energy in the Bunsen burner. Electrons in non-metals tend to be bound more tightly, um, and therefore you're going to need more energy than what a Bunsen burner can provide to get those electrons to jump up to another energy level. However, these transitions do happen in nonmetals. A common way for us to do this is to put a um, nonmetal gas into a tube and then use a high voltage spark or electricity to um, excite these electrons within the nonmetal. And what you essentially see is neon lights. So that's how neon lights work. We put a nonmetal gas 
in a tube and then we run electricity through it which is a super super high energy and it um, causes these transitions to occur and then we see a neon color a neon glow okay so understand that while we can only observe metals in the lab that does not mean that other elements do not also have um, spectral lines